Hello. Um, I will talk about my career as a senior RSE, um, but I will talk a bit less about my CV and a bit more about what I might not put on LinkedIn. And maybe anybody who might want to hire me at a later place, please leave, leave the room and don't <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> Um, given that this is recorded, so I won't go into too much, too deep uh, personal detail, but still, um, this is my condensed um, CV like I would put it on LinkedIn. So I started with the degree in media informatics. I then went on to do a PhD in scientific computing, um, did a postdoc in Durham in computational solar physics. Then I um, decided to go to industry um, for two years and um, was a computational scientist in an X-ray technology startup and rose up to senior. Um, then I went back to academia as an RSE in advanced research computing at Durham University, um, also rose up to senior and took on an additional role as um, RSE theme leader in the N8 Center of Excellence for Computationally Intensive Research. Um, the N8 are the um, eight most research intensive um, universities in the north of England. Um, yeah, and that's basically in a very com compressed form um, what I did. And as Sarah said, um, it looks all very intentional and it looks all very planned, um, but that is not really um, how things happened. So what I normally do not put on my CV is um, all the struggle with various fixed term um, contracts. So this time as a postdoc was not one contract that was um, various fixed term contracts over a, a span of about three years. Also, um, the reason that I then ended this postdoc was not um, that I decided, but I actually wanted to continue um, this career and continue in academia. But um, it turned out that um, the, the um, funding um, depended on various things um, amongst those, a letter of support from someone in the Met office and that letter of support did not come in in time. So the funding fell through, so my postdoc contract ended and then I had to start to apply for various things. Um, I had actually um, academic um, applications, so I um, applied for other, um, other postdoc positions. I also applied for an assistant professor position and so on. These all didn't come through. Um, also, my time in industry um, did not actually end in a planned way, but I was made redundant. So if somebody or hopefully most of you are not familiar how this looks like, this is the very polite way of how people um, tell you that they don't um, need you any longer. And um, yeah, actually it's quite a shock if you walk in to work one day, for me it was after actually a holiday, I came in the first day back and my boss immediately asked me into a room and basically told me, we have made your role redundant, please pack your things and off you go. So I went back home. Um, just from my very personal experience, and this might be very different to anyone um, working in industry and academia. So um, my, uh, what, I, what I've taken from these various um, roles in industry and in academia is um, in industry, I had the feeling people were much more happy to admit they didn't know something, that you might need to talk to somebody else, whereas in academia, the feeling is always like somebody has to, or you have to know everything and everybody has to know everyone. It's very much about self-promotion and um, basically making your way there. Um, on the other hand, I felt um, that I had much more freedom in academia to shape what I'm doing and to take decisions. and. It's not that somebody will tell you, oh, actually the board decided um, this project isn't in this interest in anymore, or this idea of yours, um, we won't do that because it doesn't fit into our strategy or so. So you um, are a bit freer in what you do and, and making your own decisions. But um, this also means that you might end up doing too much. And especially if you're in a real academic career, you will have this list of things of teaching, of publishing of research of administration and so on the demands just pile up 
whereas an industry it might be or usually from my experience it's a bit more defined what people want you to do but it's mostly only this they want you to do and not so much of the blue blue skies thinking um, I felt in industry, um, I didn't need to explain so much what, what it is I'm doing and um, why it actually makes sense I'm doing that, and so which, which was kind of nice. Um, yeah, I talked about fixed term contracts. I tell myself um, in academia, it's actually nice that you do something for the greater good. It's not just about, um, about profits and so, and you are actually helping people to do research for a better world or so, so you hope um, but um, on the other hand, in industry again, um, I was so happy when I had my first permanent contract there. So I had in, in academia never had a permanent contract, but it turned out these permanent contracts in industry end up not being that permanent after all, especially if you're just under this two year um, uh, range that you have in the UK before you actually have real employee rights. So um, I won't talk about that anymore. It's a longer story, but um, I also made the ex had the experience that, especially in the software technology industry, they don't really like it if somebody would like a bit more flexible working or so. So that is probably because there's so much choice of people who don't need flexible working. But um, yeah, that's what I took from that. Talking about flexible working, I had various um, ways of how to talk about flexible working in my CV and where to put it. And at the moment I've come up with this little note next to my career section where I say, actually, um, these are just the contract times I list in my CV, but there has been quite a lot of part-time working, there has been maternal leave and so, and I'm happy to tell you, but um, when I actually listed it somewhere in detail or so, um, that was not always positive. So I had my first child when I was halfway through my PhD. I did my PhD viva being seven months pregnant with my second child. So um, I had, um, various times, so throughout my pregnancies, which weren't easy, and also afterwards, so where I was off. Um, and I had basically, I think um, this is now my, oh no, I, I think in this fixed term contract during postdoc, I had the phase where I actually worked full time. Um, but this job I'm in now at the moment is basically when I am again back fully full time in my work. Um, when I applied, for various jobs in industry asking for full time, um, very many um, doors were actually closed in my face. And I experimented with um, already putting it in my motivation letter and asking at various stages throughout application processes or so. And um, so far, um, none of this really worked well. So um, people just seem to not like it if you're um, asking for flexible working for part time. And um, I've talked to other um, parents who um, were saying something similar there as well. So having a family, family and career is really great. So it's, it's really great and really proud. And as you might guess from that, I couldn't just put one photo on this slide from my kids and me. Um, I'm really proud of my two girls. Um, it's also at times really hard and frustrating and you feel constantly guilty. You feel guilty at work. You feel guilty if you're with your children. So you're always guilty that you're not doing the other thing. And I won't go into detail and where it's hard and where it's great or so because I think that would be another long talk or so. Um, but the way that um, we basically um, handled this and I want to stress that this is not a recipe and that might not work for someone else, for another family or so, um, because it's very personal, every family is different. But we basically made the decision that we want to be together, which means, um, and I've seen it working differently for other people, but we wanted to be basically during the week in the same home. So we didn't want to be in um, 
long commuting distances from work. Um, I have friends um, who actually live in different countries um, with children and so and it all works for them. But we made um, the decision early on that we said, OK, we want um, our family to be together. This has influenced many career decisions. This has, of course, limited uh, many career options. For example, when I applied for various academic positions, I basically only applied in Durham and Newcastle because I didn't want um, the long commute and um, doing it um, remotely or so um, wasn't really an option then and maybe for such a decision, uh, for such a career is not an option now as well. Um, of course, we are not doing it on our own. It's a big web of um, arrangements that you do, that you um, basically, we have a big calendar with different um, colors. And so um, having our um, various um, uh, dates that we have in there and one for my husband, one color, one color for me, then for the children and for family and friends, and then for other um, appointments. And so just to keep it all on track. So you have to constantly juggle things and we have, um, not um, our grandparents are so nearby, so we have what they call during COVID a childcare bubble. So other friends who help out and who we help out with their children. Um, we rely on uh, holiday camps and wraparound care and um, having bosses or colleagues who are actually supportive if you suddenly have to walk out of something because school called or like today as teacher strike. So my husband currently has our younger daughter with him at work. Um, so um, you really need a lot of um, support to juggle it. And also I, I think, and this is also very important is we just have, have been very lucky that things worked out and that people have been supportive and that we have two healthy children and we are two healthy parents and that's not a given and it's always more uh, difficult if one of this is not the case and so so it's not really that it's our big plan who, that, that made it work but we've also been very very lucky throughout um yeah so it's okay <laughs> what uh, what is my conclusion on my career so far so um yeah so we've done it this way career follows family so we made decision based on what um, we wanted for our family and i could not plan a lot of it a lot of these things just happened and i'm not a person so i'm normally a person that really likes to plan and likes to know what happens or so so um it didn't come naturally to, to just improvise and do it, but it kind of worked out. And one thing is that I'm interested in a lot of a lot of things. So actually it's sometimes really hard for me to decide what to do, um, but um, that's also lucky because then I had more options basically to go for. So I actually was interested in seeing what industry is like, um, but I also um, really liked academia also. So academia was so far mostly the place where I think I felt I could be and it worked for me and people valued what um, I could contribute. Um, but um, I most of the time applied for various things. And that was from choosing what to study throughout basically every career change that I did. I um, might have as well, instead of taking the RSE job, have ended up as a data analyst at a mobile bank um, that I had also applied for and actually then didn't go to the second interview because I'd rather take the RSE job. But um, it's something that at the moment for me is relevant again when I'm thinking about, okay, do I want to go more the leadership route or do I want to um, stay technical or maybe go back to being even more technical or so that I actually applied for both. And I think things work out so that I am going the technical way now. So the question uh, we were asked about, okay, what would what advice would we give for um, to our past self? And I must say, I don't know. <laughs> so. I try to think a lot about a lot of clever things to see here, to say here, but um, 
I'm not sure that I can really give advice. And also, I don't know what this advice might change that I would then not like. But I don't think that she would listen to me anyway, because she's kind of stubborn. So I just leave it at that. <laughs>